Ruiz. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfine, musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, truth seekers, and truth crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. Hey, before we get started with today's show, I just want to draw your attention to new merchandise. Funkin' Stuff and Truth and Rhythm designs are in, and they look pretty darn cool. So show your support, help support the program, and show off some stylish merchandise and apparel. Only at the Funkin' Stuff store. I'm delighted to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership singer-guitarist Kevin Goins along with his legendary brother, Glenn Goins, co-founded P-Funk offshoot band Quasar. And Kevin was also a member of General Kane's group. Along the way, Kevin Goins also teamed with leading Parliament Funkdale players Bernie Worrell and Tyrone Lampkin on the Space Cadets 1981 album. In more recent times, among other musical pursuits, he has served as the lead vocalist for the hardcore funk band known as P-Theory. Kevin, man, how are you? Welcome. I'm good, thank you. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, how are you? I'm good. Good to see you. Good to have you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Where is here right now for you? Right now I'm home. I'm at home. I'm home in Plainfield, New Jersey. Yeah. yeah so the home of the P, right? <laughs> yeah, that's where it happened, man. You know? I'm not too far. I'm I'm actually um only about 20, 30 minutes from where George was born in Kannapolis. And where? North Carolina, I'm about 20 minutes away from where George Clinton was born, so. Oh, okay, okay, your country boy. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, wow. Well, I, I'm originally from Los Angeles, but I've uh, been out here for a while, so. Okay, yeah, I was out in LA for a little while myself, my wife and I, yeah, have fun. That's how I got hooked up with General Kane. Okay. Yeah. Well, look forward to getting to that. We'll kind of go through uh, that history. Okay. And, um, you know, um, let's jump right in, Kevin, and talk about, uh, I had heard that your, your grandmother played guitar, and so you had music yeah. in the house. Um, you know, what What really pushed, first off, how many siblings were there in total besides you and Glenn? Any others? It was, well, it's, it's, uh, well, it's not tough from the top. My sister, Mary, my, she's the oldest, my brother, Tyrone, 
then my sister Deborah, then my brother Glenn, and then me. I'm the baby tomorrow. Okay. And was everybody musical or just you and Glenn? Everybody. Everybody. My brother, my brother, oldest brother, well, <laughs> Ty was the oldest. So he he could sing. He sing back, he sang background. He played a little sax. And him and my brother had a band called the Ambassadors. And he played sax in that. And he did that until he got married. And that was the end of that. My sister, she's crazy. She can sing. She can sing and she played piano. All her kids did. Everybody did. Yeah. My older sister married, she was more rhythmic. She played tambourine with us. You know what I mean? And that was fun. Yeah, we had a little band group in the house called Family Circle. It, it was fun. We had fun. <laughs> what was the age difference between you and Glenn? Uh, the four years. And four years. he was older, right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. So how much did he influence your interest in music? He was my all, you know what I'm saying? Because we, we, we did that, like everything together until he left to go on the road and stuff. But he came back and got me. And I had my little band together, which was called, at that time, was called Eclipse. And when he came back, we had to change our name to Quasar. But that's, a, that's another thing, too. And, um, yeah, but, you know, we played together every day, all day, you know, when he was home, when he was home. Yeah. We grew up like that. My father, you sit around the house, you had to wake up. When you wake up, you were playing something. You know, my father was either playing, my mother walking around singing. Something was going on. <laughs> I know you had that church influence going on, but what other types of uh, music and, and bands and songs were you really grooving to, you know, in your teens? If I had to, like right now, you mean? No, when you were in your teens. In my teens, oh, in my teens, in my teens, I was thinking to be too, I like, I love the gospel. I like the gospel, like the gospel was funky to me too, you know what I mean? With the, yeah, it was fun. I liked the gospel a lot. Then I, I moved on up to, uh, well, I had to do gospel. Let's put it that way. Because as, and as a teen, I was still going to church. I had to mind my mom and my daddy. You know what I'm saying? So we still had to play in church for a little while until we broke. Then we, we broke. It was, it was different. That's how I got to be so funky because a lot of us was out of the church. You know what I mean? It was good. It was different but good. Everybody does it, I think. It happens. What about, um, you know, songs on the radio and things like that? Who were, you know, was it the usual, you know, James Brown and, and those kinds of influences and other I mean, funk or soul? Or? I love the slide. You know, slide was like, well, man, you know, I just love the way he did that. You know? <laughs> so Sly did it for you, huh? Yeah, yeah, I love the slide. Yeah. Because he's like, you know, if you, if you actually listen, Sly keeps it in the church. <laughs> He did a churchy with it, you know, especially with him and Graham. It was like, like that was magic to me, you know, back in the day. You know about back in the day, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm a big Sly fan too. Are you kidding me? Okay. He's one of the he's one of the original architects, man. Oh yeah. Oh fun. Then again? Sly is one of the original architects. Oh yeah, no me? doubt, no yeah. doubt. Yeah, no doubt. And then you know, and then when you listen to James too, James was like he was an architect almost, you know. James Brown was a funky old boy. Did you ever uh, get to see them perform, Sly or James Brown? No, no, never. But I, I met Sly like one time. He was with George one time, and I met him real briefly, and that was it. But then when I met him, I was too, I'm going to keep it real. I was too scared and too shy to even say anything to him. But you know what I'm saying? I was like, oh, wow, that's Sly, you know? <laughs> but I did have a privilege to do that, you know? Dude. What what was it like for the family when Glenn hooked up with P Funk? When he when he left? When he hooked up with George and P Funk, what was it like for your family? I don't think it was like really not a difference at all. You know, he did my brother was like when he said he was gonna do something, it got done. So when it when it got done, it, it was no, you know, you didn't get excited about it because he said he was gonna do this. <laughs> That's how he worked. And so so he we knew he was going, you know, I don't, I don't even really know how to answer that, honestly. You know what I mean? We felt good for him, happy, that's what you mean. Yeah, of course. You know? But he said he was going, it's a lot of, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we felt good. I felt good for him. Did, did you get to go see uh, them land the mothership? Yeah, yeah, many times. Many times, because the first time, um, actually, the first time I saw when the mothership landed was he. They did um, 
Livingston. Livingston College out here, it's like in New Brunswick. And they landed the uh, mothership there, you know, and a lot of people, a lot of people talk about the George never came back to Plainfield. But George came back, he came back to Livingston. How can they land the mothership in Plainfield? It was almost the biggest Plainfield. <laughs> no, I'm on joking. But it was big, he came back. Yeah, that's when I, I think everybody in town saw that, had to be there for that. Yeah. Yeah, that was a big night. Four planes, that was a big night, you know? Yeah, I mean, and Glenn was such a huge part of the impact of that, you know, the way he brought it to church. Um, yeah. Did, did, uh, did you realize, you know, I mean, you probably did, but for someone like me as a fan, um, his talent as a singer and the feeling he brought was just incredible. Yeah, it was. But, you know, you know, my brother, my brother, he was like, he could be around here at the house, and this is true. He could be around here, he could come home off the road, or anytime, even like when we come up, if he felt like singing, and he sat down, we had a big piano in the living room right over here, where, from where I'm sitting right now, a big upright piano. And he used to just sit down and start playing and singing every time. My mother and father, we walk around the house, just cut everything off. <laughs> you know, we had to just let him go and do his thing. He gave a show one time down at uh, Plainfield High School, well, he did it. It was called the Glen Goings Christmas Extravaganza. And he did every Christmas carol that you would want to hear by himself on Baby Grand. And it was, it was like, and then back then, nobody had thought about filming. You know what I mean? Wish we had him. Yeah. A lot of stuff, a lot of memories, you know what I mean? Yeah. Did, did he, uh, are there one or two stories that he shared with you from his experiences? with P-Funk that maybe you could share with us? <laughs> it's a, a lot of the stories that he, well, not, not as much as far as like getting into his business, so I can't talk about that. But um, he, he told me so. He, he, had, he was like a comedian too, so I know a lot of funny stuff. You know, I think that wouldn't even be appropriate. <laughs> it's like, there's a lot, there's a lot of stories. Yeah, but like he was glad, you know what I'm saying? Because it was like a push. I think he, my brother did a lot of things through Parliament. Like, yeah, he got like, he did a lot of stuff like with uh, Johnny Chow. A lot of people he did work with. I don't, some, a lot more people than I know about probably, you know. But like Johnny Chow and Frank, I know Frank Zappa was like at one time, that was a boy. And stuff. there was stories about Frank Zappa. <laughs> it's just funny. You know? It's real funny. Yeah, he was on uh, Disco Lady, right? Yeah. With Johnny Taylor. Yeah. yeah. I think that him, Bootsy, and Bernie, too. I don't know. I don't know who I was with. I think that was the crew. Yeah. Richard Boyd? Yeah. Oh, Richard, that was back in the day. That was real back in the day. With my brother with the bags, you know, you heard about them? Who? And the bags. It was a group before my brother left the global parliament. His group was called the bags. Him and Richard Boyce. And like, oh, Richard Boyce, Gary Brunsky, Shahidi Bank, a whole bunch of them. But they was bad. That was good. And that's when my day came and got my brother when he was at the bag. He left the bag to go with Paul. Yeah. Did, did the bag play any originals or just covers or what? Oh, no. Yeah, they had originals. They had bland. Yeah, they had originals. <laughs> yeah. They were good. They good. They were good. And like Richard Boyce was like one of the, uh, he was like one of the originals. The, the very first bass player I think George had, him and his brother Frankie. But that's way back, you know, way before me. I don't even think I was born. <laughs> I might have been but little. Yeah. So did you get a chance to meet, you know, most of uh Parliament Funkadelic before you know you got out on uh Quasar? So did you get yeah, to yeah, yeah. like me and Eddie, me and Eddie, me and Eddie used to hang out almost like every day. And even to like now to this day, you know, I meet with Billy almost like every day, Billy Nelson every day. And when Bernie, when Bernie was home, we used to, I'd be at Bernie's house, like you know, they, they was like family, it's just family. You know, so it wasn't like no, ah! <laughs> it was, hey, me and my wife was driving past Eddie's house one time and our door fell off the car. And it, <laughs> all he could do is him and his mother would sit there and laugh. <laughs> That's playing field for you. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, especially, you know, with Eddie and Bernie not with us anymore. Uh, rest in peace, those guys. Um, right. What can you tell viewers about uh first eddie in terms of you know what was he like as a guy and what do you think of his talent eddie was bad eddie was like my best friend eddie was like well mentor we we would get together every day 
and play. He was a, he was just a, he was normal. He was a guy. He he was like no head, no nothing. He was just Eddie. You know, I seen Eddie going to the store one time. And I said, Eddie, look at your feet. He looked down. He had his shoes on the wrong feet. That's Eddie. That, <laughs> that's Eddie. He was cool. And you, it's just like just like my older brother. That's the only thing I said about all of them. It's like big brothers. You something you looked up to them kids, them guys. You know? And he was and it showed you a lot. They didn't mind showing you anything. If you was willing to learn, they'll show you. And they'd be your friend. Bernie, Bernie was my dude. <laughs> Bernie was lots of fun. I love Bernie. I miss him so much. I miss all of them. And Bernie, me and Billy, we still kick it strong like right now. You know? Like I'm doing a gig, um, matter of fact, next week with Jerome. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. 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 We definitely need those that are still with us to to keep it alive, you know. No doubt, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Man. So, what was your impression of, uh, if you remember, like the first time you met George Clinton? Oh, the first first time I met George. I, don't, I forgot how old I was, but I was young. My brother had my brother had just got with so my brother got one with George. I don't, I forgot how old my brother was at that time. But um, they was playing at the Sugar Shack in Boston, and um, we get up to the show. My older brother Ty, he took me up there, and we get to the show, and I think Standing on the Verge had just came out or something like that. One just came out, but they playing it, and I asked my older brother, I said, "Why are they playing that song before they go on stage?" And he just looked at me and laughed. And when I got into the club, they were playing. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> they was tight like that. And then I met George in the dressing room. My brother introduced me to him and stuff. And that's the very first time I met George. George. I was at the Sugar Shack. Yeah. And, and did he strike you as being crazy or just uh, down to earth and cool? Or? They just seemed so real, man. It wasn't no start or no nothing. They were just real. <laughs> You know, and having they see they they had that inspired me a lot too because they had fun doing what they were doing, you know. So that's I wanted to do that, you know. And what about Gary? Gary, I Gary was family too because I played I played on um, bass for his father in a group called the Southern Manual, a gospel group. So I like Gary was like family. I grew up with all his brothers and stuff, you know. Plainfield is a plain is a big town, a big family, <laughs> you know. How how fun for those that haven't been to Plainfield? I don't think I have. I've been, you know, to a few spots in Jersey, but not there. Um, you know, is is funk permeating like throughout Plainfield, or is it just this one tight circle? All oh, through Plainfield, it was it was a time in Plainfield you can walk from one end of the Plainfield without hearing a band and read like two or three bands on each block through the whole town, and everybody was playing. I mean, not just fooling around. They were the bands that was playing. <laughs> yeah, the bands. There were some bands that playing for them really should have went all the way, but you know things happen. Yeah. Like they had a band out here called the Illusion, and these these guys was bad. Gary's little brothers, the Shider Boys. They was oh man, they was bad talking about some singing. Joe, they had a sister named Peanut that would kill you. <laughs> she could sing. There's a, a lot of lot of talent around here. Still is now. The youngins is coming up now, so it's good. And, they, and everybody still the real real cats now. They still in the church, so you gotta wait till they get old enough to come out. <laughs> come out loud, <laughs> What what kind of tunes was uh, Clips playing? We were playing gospel with the um, we were playing funk, but with the gospel feel, with the gospel feel. Yeah. So you had some originals in Eclipse. Tunes? Yeah, we had, we had, I, the Eclipse turned into when the, the lot of the first album of a Quasar was Eclipse. It was Eclipse because me, Mucci, and Jeff, we have been, we've been have been together like well with Jeff the drummer. When my brother passed away, I think Jeff had just turned maybe 15, 15 16 or something like that. I had just turned seventeen. And wow, Mucci, you were just you were just a, he was twenty four. You were still in high school uh, when Quasar started, or out of high school. I was in, I was out, but I was in, I was supposed to graduate. Yeah, I was out of school. I was out of school. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I got this here. Uh, this was Ooh. purchased <laughs> the, the week it came out in 1978. So I still got my original copy here. Yeah, yeah. You know? That's it. Uh, that's it. <laughs> yeah. I remember hearing, uh, you know, funk and roll for the first time on the radio. And I was just blown away. And, you know, what a great first record. You know, it was among the strongest, you know, right up there 
as far as like P Funk related, right. you know, offshoots, mm-hmm. it was definitely way up there. And, um, you know, I was, of course, devastated, you know, what happened with Glenn. Um, and, and then the fact of what happened to the group after that was, you know, a shame. But um, what, uh, what can you tell us about the process of creating that album? I know at first it was going to be with Westbound, right? And then you yeah. had to like re- redo it or something? Yeah, Westbound, we went through a legal battle with Westbound. And then uh, like in a matter of a couple months, we had we signed, uh, my brothers I signed, got us a deal with uh, Arista and stuff. So we had like, yeah, we had like a rush to get it done because we couldn't do the first album. We couldn't do. We had to. It had to do it all over. Had to do a whole new. It was fun though, you know. It was rushed, but the way it happened, it was just like you know. I'm not saying to say, but it was a lot of like God was right there, so you know, it just made it happen even better. It was a lot. Of, it was good. It was good. It was, I don't know, lost my train of thought, Joe. <laughs> We're talking about making that record. You know what the process was like. Yeah, the pro- it was it was good. We just had to like had to do a lot of writing. My brother had to do a lot of writing, and the band had to do a lot of writing. And tried to get, I think, the last song, the last song, my brother that we should have put on the album was um, wow, was going to be either Adi that that never got released, or um, it's, it's one song called Who's the Doctor, and he was going to either do that with a um, mutiny, or a Quasar. So we had to change. So I came up with um, me and Gray Fitz and a couple of others, and Jeff Mucci came up with like um, funk, get funk and roll, not funk and roll, funk with a capital G, and like working on the building and stuff like we had to, you know, just get the feelings and use the songs that was already cut, you know what I mean? And then match them up, and it worked. It worked. But funk and roll, funk and roll came up. It, that was magic. That was pure magic. That was magic. Yeah, I mean that uh, with the right push, I think that would have been a really big hit. But uh, it still got good play, and yeah, it was especially interesting to me too because right at that time, One Nation or Groove came out, and uh, Charlie was on there with the same kind of chant, funk, get yeah, ready yeah, to roll. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so who came up with it first? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was time perfect, uh, but you know things happen. That's all I can say. Yeah, man. What, what can... I, I haven't seen a, uh, a Quasar album in a long time. I got mine upstairs, but I haven't seen nobody else have one in a long time. <laughs> yeah. I got the CD too, but I wanted to show you the okay. original vinyl. Um, what what transpired in, in the P-Funk camp that you knew about that you could share uh, that led to, you know, Bigfoot and, and Glenn kind of going off and doing their own thing? I mean, that first mutiny record as a fan i didn't know i had no idea what was going on in the p-funk camp with george and whatever and then to see all that artwork that that uh jerome did on that record that first mutiny record you know all that stuff there was obviously some stuff going on behind the scenes what was your experience with it my experience is i'm be like you know i'm keep it honest i don't know i wasn't there I don't know. And then I don't, I'm not the person that go back and say, oh, man, I heard this and I heard that. But I don't know. I honestly don't know. You know, <laughs> so you, you can lose a lot of friends talking about something you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I yeah. don't know. I don't, you know, just, that just keep it like that. I, I really don't know. Well, when when did you find out, you know, that Glenn kind of wanted to go off and do more of his own thing? My brother, he was he was always like that in life. Because if he said, like I said earlier, if he said he was going to do something, then he, he was going to do it. So we knew when he came back to get Quasar, we knew it was time for him. He was getting ready to leave. We knew that right then. Because his dedication is one thing. You know, but when, when that fall, when he started to do something else, he put all that, he would put everything he got into a project that he did. So when we seen him, like, starting to leave, he know that we knew that that was over. You could tell, you know. Like you with your girl, you can tell, you can look at it, you can say, oh, this is old, man. <laughs> <laughs> did, did, you know, did you know that he was sick at the time? Yeah, man, I knew my brother. I knew when he first got sick. That was my brother. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Um, did anybody know that? It, we had two beds in our room, in my room upstairs. We slept in the same room. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, were you a little uh, kind of mentally prepared of what 
was going to happen around the time of the record, or was it? Not at all. The night, the day my brother died, we were um we had to do a gig in Philly with um Cameo Son and Fat Little Larry's band or something like that. And then after the gig, we went to the after party. You know, after party, we in that we party and stuff with Tina. She came to me and said, "Kevin, we gotta go. Glenn's um Glenn's gone." I said, "He gone where?" Because I, you know, I ain't believe nothing at that time, you know, and everybody else knew except me. So no, I had I had no, I wasn't prepared at all. No, it it hurt, it hurt it hurts me talking about it now sometimes, but um, yeah, I still ain't prepared for it. Too. Yeah, well, I'm just glad that I can help, you know, perpetuate the legend of your brother mm -hmm. yeah. and, you know, keep people knowing about him and hearing it and appreciating it because he was an amazing talent. And, um, you it's know, some, I've, I've had people on this show uh, who have played with all kinds of, you know, singers from Marvin Gaye to whoever. And a lot of them think that Glenn was as good as it gets on the vocals. So. I would love to have yeah, that he could say he could he could when he like I said when he his voice was captivating so you know like when he he sang every man every just thing just stop I see him in the studio do the same thing just started singing he, that's one of the songs I think I'm gonna do over in a minute too called Saturday Night and he just played it and everybody that's in the studio just like it, you know and then you have you have to catch him too because you know when if you don't stop, and he finds that you're looking at him. That'll be the end of the song. You never get to hear it, so you gotta be really, you know what I'm saying? Oh, he's singing, y'all. Be quiet, be quiet. <laughs> That's how that was. It was fun. What What was he like, sort of directing? Um, you know, I assume he did some direction of players in the studio for the Quasar record. But the Quasar, yeah, that that last song I said too. With the Quasar album was so magical, and it was like it was so heavenly done. It was that we had the whole album was like fun. It, it was work, but it was just it was it was like what we were just one. You know what I'm saying? You know you know what I'm saying? We was just one. His direction and his guidance, yes, yes, we needed we needed that for real. But he said he was like he just let us have freeway, free reign. Yeah, you, know, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. And it was fun. It was real fun. And you know, it just kept it. I guess you can hear it too. You can hear the energy in the song. Definitely. You know, we had yeah. a ball with it. Yeah, especially like the first three cuts are just blistering, man. They're just kicking ass. Um, <laughs> you know, it really sets the pace for that record. Um, <laughs> how many uh, did you guys get to play out live at all? Did you get to play those songs or? Yeah, we was out. We went out. We did. Yeah, we went out for a little while. We went out for. Um, we was out with Rolls Royce. We was out with Mother's Finest. We was out with Camel. We was out Evan Sam. Yeah, we was out. We played. We got them out. Yeah, we played a while. We yeah, we got. A, we had to get a bus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how, how, yeah comfortable, how comfortable were you on stage performing? Is that like uh, something you're very comfortable with, or were back then? That being on stage is like being at home to me. It's, that's that's where I, I have my best enjoyment at. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, in the studio, and that's like doing what I'm doing like right now. You know, just it's just like home. It's just what you're supposed to do. You know? <laughs> yeah, man, it's fun. I love being on stage. Yeah. Did Did you ever have any interest, or was there any talk about you maybe, you know, playing with P Funk itself? You know, being part of that at all? No, I, I haven't heard anything about. It. I, you know, I did. I did some things like if George was in town. I was there. I used to walk out on stage or something to do some stuff like that. But no, I don't think so. No, mm -mm. too late now. Too old. Too tired. No, no. I, I mean, I mean, around the time of Quasar, when you oh, were no, young. Oh no, 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 mm -mm. no, no, no. Because no. Quasar, but the, the thing was, when Quasar broke up, it was, it was, it was a. Uh, it was just like my brother left and everybody didn't grasp it too good. So we didn't know what to do. So we left. Everybody just left. That's how I have no bad feelings. It was feeling some people might have bad feelings. I ain't had none. I just wanted to, and I just I didn't want to play anymore. I didn't want to play anymore. So But when Glenn was actually with Parliament Funkadelic, did you have any interest or hopes of being part of that too? Or no? At at the same time with my brother? Yeah. That, that's what Quasar was going to probably end up being like. Right. You know? 
You know what I'm saying? So no, you, no, not really, because it, for real, we play together every day. So it's not like it would be. It would have been fun. Yes, I'm not gonna say that. It would. It probably would have been fun. But I never thought about it. But that was his job. You know what I mean? That was his job. You know that. Yeah, it would have been fun. That would have been fun. Yeah. Now that you made me think about. It. <laughs> <laughs> Did did you uh, play with Mutiny at all or no? Not, no well, Mutiny, how can I say it? Mutiny, Jerome is, right now, Jerome is Mutiny. Yeah. So after my brother, when my brother, the original Mutiny was my brother, Jerome, Harry Watson, Butch Watson. Um, who else was it? Some, some, some other people my brother had, but Moochie, my, bro, my uh, Quasar bass player, he, just, he did a lot of bass player on the original Mutiny stuff. Jeff played a lot of stuff on it. Uh, on the mutiny stuff, which is Quasar drama, and him and Jeff play back to back. Like Jeff, Jay played on Quasar album. Jeff played some stuff on the mutiny album. I played some stuff on the mutiny album, and I think Lenny was Lenny. No, Lenny wasn't with Jerome there. Um, yeah, that's how that one was like on family. Yeah. Oh, so you played some on the mutiny record? Yeah, some on some of them, and a lot of the mutiny the original mutiny stuff has. I don't think Jerome released it yet because a lot of them I still have. So. There's a lot of stuff still need to be met so people here. Yeah. So after uh, what happened with Quasar, you took a little time off, and then at some point you uh, hooked up with Mitch McDowell. How did that happen? Oh, well, <laughs> that's a funny story. Me and my wife, my brother Ty was living in California. And me and my wife, we told my mom that we was going out there to visit my brother for the 4th of July in 1980. And we didn't come back to 85. Cause I, when I got out there, I started playing around. I met, I seen Billy. I got hooked up with Billy Nelson out there, and we started playing around with Stony. Stony was the girl that used to sing background with uh, Tina Turner in the Ike Let, and we started messing around with her. And I met Dawn. I seen Dawn Silver at the studio with General Kane with Mitch, and she introduced me to Mitch, and I sang uh, uh, for Lovers Only for Mitch, and he asked me to join the group right there, and I joined the group. Right That's how that went. And I stayed. <laughs> yeah, you're on, I think, like five records or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what, uh, that. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, then then I think we went to Capitol. Then after that, after that, uh, General K, we went to uh, Motown. Yeah. What can you tell us about uh, Mitch? Uh, because he's really sort of an enigma. People don't really know him. I mean, some people know General Kane, the name. But they don't really know Mitch, and he was such a, a talent that kind of was unsung, I think. Mitch, again, uh, back back to being real, Mitch was real. You know, he, he was just real. He didn't have no big head. He was Mitch. He was he, Actually, he was a roadie for, um, for war back in the day, and he played bass, and he played real nice bass, too. But he, he was serious about what he was doing, and he did, he did it all day, every day. He was, he was just he was, he was humble. You know, he was, a, he was a good guy. Mitch was good. He was a really good guy. I miss him. You know, he was a really good guy. He did, he'd give you the shirt off his back. So he's one of them kind of guys. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Really, really good guy. Tal, and, and he could, you could sit around Mitch and just start humming something. And he'll say, come on, let's go. Because he had a studio in his house. He's like, come on, let's go. We're going to the studio next thing you know. We cutting it. <laughs> he was that kind of guy. It was fun being with him. You know? He has a, a, ga a gang of, of great jams that, you know, if people haven't gotten into it, they need to check it out because uh, not all of them got a lot of radio play. But um, right. I got uh, actually this one here. Oh, the girls album. Yeah, that's the is, first album I did with them. This is probably my favorite because this one out of all of them probably has the most P-Funk influence, I think. But You uh, do? <laughs> yeah. Um, isn't this the one that even has like Maceo and some of the guys on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maceo, Fred Wesley, and Ray Davis. Yeah, Don, uh, Don's on there. Yep. Yep, yep. So, yeah, there's a, the back picture. Oh, yeah, that's in the back of the album. Back. Oh, there go Trey Stone. Wow, and Tony Padler. I ain't seen them guys in a long time. Wow. Yeah, man, look at Chad. Look at them. <laughs> yep, that was, that was the first thing. Okay, that's them. Yeah, I heard you did something with Trey Stone, huh? Yeah, he, Trey's been on the show, um, and uh, so Daryl Dixon was on. Okay, yeah, Trey Stone, cool too. That's my friend. Yep. Yeah, Trey he Stone lives. Uh, he lives uh, in California. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Last time I seen I seen Trey, we was at we was at rehearsals with General, with General, when he was uh playing with us. We was at rehearsals with General Kane, and um, we was uh, I think we went back to the studio with Climax or something. One of us went back there. <laughs> we was hanging out with Climax. Yeah. How, how much did you get out on the road with uh, General Kane? Man, that was a long ago. I can't even remember. I understand because we did we did like a lot of gigs in um in California, but the major gig I got I got he blessed me really good was when we went to Stockholm, when we went to Sweden. That was a really good gig. Was that your uh, only time overseas? No, no, no. When I was with um uh, at my first time, yeah, that was my very first time. My very first time over there was with General Kane, but when I started going back and forth with Pete Theory. You know, I started going back over there like every other month. I was going back. Well, yeah. What was it like that that first trip though with General Kane was just uh, mind blowing for you? Yeah, it was, man. It, it honestly was because you know you see things that on TV and you know the air things and stuff, and you want to see it. So when you get there, you be like, wow. But I know for a fact that it was the most cleanest place I ever seen in my life. <laughs> you know, it was really nice. But with just going through um, everything with Pete Theory overseas and stuff, it was, it was a learning experience because I like history. It was like a real learning um, experience over there with doing And it was good. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinslift.net. Thank you very much.